Hey, this is Henry Sanders back with another episode of Real Talk. Uh, we want to thank our sponsors at Park Bank. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you for being supportive of a Real Talk for the past couple of years. Thank you for helping us with Connect Black, with anyone out there. If you're a small business entrepreneur, uh, we have a, a platform that called Connect Black on a Mass 365 website. Go sign up for free and uh, let people know what you're doing, where you're at. Uh, so... Today, I have a, uh, a man who I truly respect, uh, and I have the utmost admiration for the stuff that he's done. I tend to be a practitioner. As you know, I'm not a, like a person who goes off ideas and like someone just wrote a book. I'm really about people who have actually done the work. Uh, and um, this man has done the work for over and over again, knock down, gets back up, knock down, gets back up, thrives, and has been very consistent and been unapologetically black the whole time um, in Madison and in the Midwest, which is not easy. Uh, so, and he's a, and he's a pastor uh, doing it at the same time. So I know a lot of people who know this man is, he has a lot of people who uh, follow him, uh, the reverend, the doctor, the <laughs> pastor, uh, Reverend Alex G, dude, do you call Al you want to call Alexander or are you Alex or what are you? What do you? You know, I'm feeling by? I'm feeling Alexander today. I'm feeling I can, that I can today. see that. I, I feel like I feel like that regal like Alexander. No like, one asked oh. me that on interviews, so thank you for doing that. They'll ask me if they should call me Doctor or not, but no one ever asked if they should call me Alexander. Man, after hitting fifty about seven years ago, yeah. I, said, I finally grown into my Alexander. It was too big yeah. when I was six years old in first grade, but it but I'm grown feels now. good yeah. now. Yeah, it's good can, right now, man. It's great to be here. Thank you for those kind words, Brother yeah. Sanders. I really appreciate it. I feel your sincerity. And it means a lot to me to hear that from another leader influencer from my community, from our community. So thank you. No, I, sincerely, I, you know, old, older I get in the game and gray hairs and experience. <laughs> right. You, you, you learn to respect the people who actually done the work there. I've learned there's something to longevity and consistency. Yes. yes. Uh, excellence to me now at my age is the people who've done something over a, a long period of time and been consistent with the effort to strive to get excellence over a long period of time. If someone does something once, I mean, it is hot. I only, you know, you can be hot, but people who are excellent are the people who do it over a period of time and consistency. And you can say, oh, like if they keep doing it over and over again, it's not luck. They're not hot. There's something about their <laughs> character. It's about something that they actually do all the, there's something about there's something about you, Pastor, that you have built something in you, and I'm not sure what it is yet. I hope we can get that through this interview. Sure. But there's something <laughs> in you that has built you to be a little different because you you're not your typical pastor, and you have not taken the typical pastor way of building stuff. Hence Nehemiah, etc. But you've also been very innovative how you operate and see the world, and at the same time being unapologetically black. It's fascinating to me how that works. Um, so first, let's let's take a step back. Tell me, you grew up in. I said no. So you grew up. You didn't grow up in Madison. What you were born in? I was born in Chicago, but I've Chicago. been in Madison since I was since I was six. So I've been here. I mean, this is this is what I consider home. So you grew up. So you're six. I knew you grew up on the South Side. So mm -hmm. I always give you a hard time on South Side. You sure but do. You, sure but, do. But, but I, I loved. I, I used to live on the South Side when I was younger too. So and you all moved um, on up, right, to the East Side. <laughs> north, north side, north side. Yeah, you know, east and north is the same in Madison, but I get it. Never mind. It's totally, your show. It's, totally it's, it's your show. It's just and it only, Madisonian, <laughs> only Madisonians know what we're talking about. <laughs> right, right, right. And it should, right. All these people live some different place. Like, what are they talking about? Um, and so, I, so you grew up in Madison, you grew up and you became a pastor at a very early age. What, how old was that? I started preaching when I was um, 15. I actually, and this was a living room church. I think the story, well, the story is, um, you know, back in the early seventies, people didn't try out new churches. You know, if you're going to start going to church, if you were Baptist, if you were Pentecostal, you found that same stream. Ours was the church of God in Christ, black Pentecostal denomination. There was not one here. So my mother asked her childhood pastor from Chicago, he would come to Madison and start a church. And so he did that for 10 years. So my first church, real church experience was in the living room. And in those days, if the old folks felt you and I mean that respectfully, the older elders, if they felt you had the calling, they would tell you. So they told me at 15 that I had a calling. I was licensed to preach when I was 16. 
And a calling, a, and, a, and a, hang on, for people to understand, a calling mean that you you had a like God a purpose, you yeah, a you purpose. had a purpose, yeah. To, right. The people say, "I see something in you," like, mm -hmm. and I, I, you know, I, I'm saying this sort of tongue in cheek, but like a light over your head, like those folks could tell who the preachers were. Preachers were the guides. They were the muse, the muses. They were the leaders in our community. So the old folks knew who had the touch, the call um, to lead. So it was to communicate, to communicate scripture, but to also lead people towards um, greater fulfillment in their lives, greater faith, greater community activism. So they told me that when I was 15. Licensed me when I was 16 in 1980. That didn't mean I could do weddings or stuff, but what it basically was like a learner's permit. I was asked to be the assistant pastor of our church in 1981. I have been in pastoral ministry for 40 years. Feels like the wilderness sometimes for 40 years. The next year will be my 35th anniversary as a senior pastor. Oh, but I have 40 years in pastoral ministry. Thank you, man. So, yeah, and that all started in a living room church on Fisher Street on the south side of Madison. How does a 15 year old young man in Madison, because, you know, at 15, you know, what I was thinking about at 15 was right. sports and girls and right. other things, you know, not being called by God. That's, that alone is a heavy. Just by someone saying that to you is a heavy responsibility. Yeah, it, it, right. So how did you decide at 15 to take on that responsibility? Did you understand the responsibility, what that meant at a 15-year-old young man? I, I didn't. I really appreciate the, the, the line of questions because I'm really asked this today. You know, I, I'll say this and I'll jump back to your question, um, Brother Sanders. So many times people ask me about my strategies and my staff and things I'm doing today as a 57-year-old. It was the decisions that that 15-year-old made that allows me to be the man I am today. He made it. It's easy for me to, to wait to ride the wave now because the doors are open. I'm connected with people on LinkedIn. They follow me on Twitter. They support my podcast. They donate to my nonprofit. But that 15-year-old kid dealing with hormones and bad acne um, and trying to grow into his teeth. Um, I would say this. The people who told me they saw something in me were such credible folks. It was my grandmother. It was my grandmother's pastor. It was also my mother's pastor. These were credible people. You know, I felt like these are the Moseses of our generation, not because they were widely known, but because they were so resolute in their faith, so committed. They, they lived through depression. They lived through war. They lived through Jim Crow. They lived through separate but equal, but still had joy, could still come to church on Sundays and do their holy dance. It was, there was something about the way they handled this world because they were so convinced that the next world was better, that they knew how to be effective here, but preparatory for there. So I couldn't just ignore it, although I tried to. But then I started having my own dreams. I started having my own ahas. I started having things that nobody was around. And I, I was getting messages. Like there's a picture I show the church, Henry, uh, where I have a shovel in my hand. I had a dream when I was 14, 15. And in this dream, I said to our pastor, his name was Pastor Ford, and had a major ministry on the west side of Chicago. Um, I said in this dream, Pastor Ford, the Lord showed me where we're going to build our church because as a house church, he was really preoccupied with having a building because you were legitimized if you had a building. I said, God showed me where we were going, where we're going to build the new church. I took him into the woods. I had the shovel and I said, let me show you. And then I put the shovel in the ground and I woke up and I said, so at 14, 15, I'm dreaming that I'm carrying the shovel, which now looking back, that was somebody trying to give me a message that I was going to build a ministry, that I was going to be caring. I didn't know what it meant. And because it was muddy in that dream, I didn't want Pastor Ford's new shoes to get muddy. So I was carrying his shoes while I was putting the shovel in the ground. Like, wow. that's all kind of symbolism, you know, has all kinds of symbolism in it. So when you start having that kind of stuff that I remember so vividly when I was 14 years old and others that I remember as if I had it yesterday, pretty soon I got that. I, I, I got I got convinced. And I'm not saying this either, Brother Sanders, by way of bragging, but I say the way I was brought up and, and what I thought it meant to follow God, there were decisions I made. And again, I'm not trying to be judgment. I'm just saying I, there were decisions I made about not partying, not getting caught up in stuff, not getting involved in sex, not getting involved in stuff. I just, I just made decisions. I just thought these are things I can do. I can't control the future. I don't know where this is going. But I got a sense of what it means that if you are, if you have this special thing with God, let me at least meet God halfway. Now, theologically, that makes no sense. I don't, I don't believe or teach that. But as a kid, I felt, let me at least do some things to, to act and function differently as if I were gifted in chess 
or math or martial arts. They're just certain things you don't do, you don't eat, you don't go. So I made big decisions when I was 15 that I think set me up for what I'm doing today. Folks don't know that what I'm doing today, I've been waiting for it for 40 years. Well, and this is why we're, like, we're doing this podcast, right? Because one, you said something that I'm, and I've talked to, you know, I talked to so many leaders uh, all the time and the ones who really thrive almost all have mentors. Like, you know, you called it Moses and your pastor and your your mother and all that, but it's always people who are strong mentors that people help guide them, like consistently, uh, that they have people who are really guiding them, which also talks about our community, how we have to be more, we have to make sure that we are mentors for our youth and guide them because I don't know if our community is doing that as much. Like when your mama or my mama or my grandmama, what they would pull me inside say, hey boy, pull you the pants up or do A, B, C, and D. There's a sense of that I think we've lost in the community. Mm -hmm. But um, so to hear that from you is one. But I, I think it's interesting to hear that you are were in tune enough now to say decisions that I made back when I was 15 directly impact who I am today, right? Yes. And, and I don't know if we recognize that. And I'm the same way. I look back at my life now. I'm like, oh, like I fall back on what I did in high school all the time. High school is a perfect lab for me to learn. Sure. Everything, everything I do, I always fall back in high school. I can go back. Everything I am today, I can fall back in high school and say, I did this, I did that, I did this, I can do right. that. Right. Right. And all those decisions add up to be who you are today. Definitely. Uh, and which is fascinating to me to hear you saying that and you being attuned and know that. Mm -hmm. But how did you figure out faith to keep, how did you say, I'm a young man of 15? that my faith is going to keep me alive. Because you grew up in a, a time when the culture was becoming more robust and the culture sure, was opening sure. up to a lot of different things. How did you decide, how did you keep that that tunnel vision to say, I'm going to stay in this lane? Because that couldn't have been easy. No, no, it wasn't. You know, I, I my real commitment to faith happened around 1975, 75, 76, when I was in middle school. So I actually got a jump. So by the time the gangster rap and stuff came out, my head was on, was on pretty straight. And I have friends who are like following me. So like my sister, Pastor David Smith, like we're the three longest preachers in the city. Like we were here, like every other minister of every other, any ecum ecumenical persuasion, we were doing this work when they came to town. Um, and so, so I think a couple of things happened. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't an athletic kid. I didn't really grow into my athleticism until I was in high school and found out that I was, a, that was a decent quarter miler. Um, I wasn't a popular kid. I wasn't, I was picked like close to last in gym class. I kind of <laughs> sat by myself, either my pants was flooding or my Afro wasn't tight or my acne was bad. And so I was like one of those awkward geeky kids. So for me, faith was a sense of acceptance. It was a sense of confidence and it gave me a sense that, okay, I might seem invisible to my peers and friends, the people who I want to be known by and revered by, but I had the sense that this God who I'm reading about in scripture, like not only knows me, but has a plan for my life. That was very centering for me, very centering in a time where I think other kids are trying to find identity in other places. I found it not in religion, but really in this relationship that I was destined for something. And and, and, and the indication I was getting, Henry, back in these days, like this is the late 70s, the indication I was getting as a little kid is that I was going to be well known. Um, I got a clear indication that I share with my friend Derek Jones, David Smith, my sister. This was in a, like a, a meeting we were having at 79, 1979. Man, I was 16. I said, hey, y'all, um, I was praying and I feel like I got this message that one day this house, our church is not going to be in the living room. I heard that it's going to be on a hill. Now, Henry, you know where our church is. It's going to be it's on, on a, a hill. hill. I said, and the whole city is going to see it. And one day we're going to do something on that hill that's going to make it make people shake their heads and say, well, that must be a God, because there's no way they could do that. There's absolutely no way they could do that. That made me make a decision about that hill when people tried to get us to sell that space to maybe swap properties and go someplace else. A message I felt that I got when I was 16 in the late 70s is driving what I'm doing today in 2021. And so too many people talk to me about the man today and not that 15, 16 year old boy carrying the burden at a hill. The whole city going to see it. People are going to actually shake their heads at what we're doing. And that governed my decisions, 
my ministry and my faith for the next four decades. I, what? So like two things, one for people <laughs> who know Pastor G to hear him say that he was like, he wasn't that guy. Like he was the shy guy, the reserved guy, the one like he wasn't the cool, the cool guy. Well, he I was teased and bullied. Like if I want oh, I was, yeah, I was picked on. I was picked and on as a kid. And now if you, for you who don't know uh, Pastor G, <laughs> He has so much swagger, like 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 he's like really well known, super confident. People know him. He walks in the room, he lights up the room. So to hear that is eye open. So that any anyone who's younger listening to this and saying where you're starting, where you're going, that should be hope for anyone. <laughs> um, so that I mean, that's like you know right. Uh, that's very and two, true. And what's too is interesting to me is again going back to people who are really successful. They have really strong visions or a goal. Sometimes right. they don't know, but they have a strong vision that they know where they're going, right? And so yes. that is fascinating. That you had God give you a vision at 15 and you stuck with that. That's yeah. that's amazing. Okay, so you you get through that. Mm-hmm. You, you go to you go to UW Madison. You went to UW Madison. I did. Correct? I did right out of high school. I was 17, a 17 year old freshman. Why'd you graduate? So why, you graduated early. A late high birthday. School? Have a November birthday. So me, my mom, my sister, my daughter, we all started college really young because we had those late birthdays. But so I, so I was, man, I was so young. My first day at UW, I was trying to figure out where's homeroom. How do they take, how do they take attendance? Where's my locker? Like where, do I, where, where do I put my coat? Like I had, although I'd applied and everything, I had no idea how college worked. But yeah, went to UW, started in 1981. In Madison, UW mm-hmm. Madison, yes, one, had to be one of the few black folks on campus at that time. Even though the eighties, that's when black folks were the seventies, eighties when black folks really started coming to UW. Right, that's mm-hmm. when the like my dad went to law school, and I said that's when like black folks were coming into UW. So that's sure. Yes, we stepped back from then, but yeah, that during that time you could see you could see a growing number, still small number, but a growing number. What made you stay in Madison and stay in a white environment? Um, after you got your, your degree, you could have moved anywhere. Being a pastor, you moved down south. You mean you could have a, a quadruple mega church down there, probably at this point. Sure, sure. Uh, what your talent, your skill, and like you, and, and, and I have to give you credit. You give one of like you preaching is one of the best preachers you hear. Like you give story, like he's a fabulous preacher. Man, thank you, thank um, you. Why stay in Madison? You, you know, Henry, it, comes, it goes right back to the sense of call. Um, ideally, this is not where you want to be because it's a, it's a transient place. Black folks who have grown up here is an oddity. And the fact that you are, but you were born here, right? Well, I was, no, I was born in Gary, Indiana, but I was here for since I was a week old. My sure. dad came in for law school. And I've been so you were real since. young. That's even more of a rarity for, for folks who have basically been here their entire lives. Um, the black people I met in campus weren't from here. They came here for, you know, for good education, for, for an, on an athletic scholarship. And they were going back to Chicago, Milwaukee, Gary, Atlanta. Um, and so you're right. It was not a place that people wanted to go. And I did try to get out of here. In fact, I tried to go to UW Oshkosh. Um, I, I was recruited by them. I had a spot on the men's track team. I was going to run the four by four at open four. Um, and at the last minute, I felt that nudge. Nope, you're not supposed to leave Madison. You got something to do here. And so when I made the decision to pull out of UW Oshkosh and apply to Wisconsin late, like in the summer, like, you know, you just can't be applying at Wisconsin. I applied late and, um, and got in. It was after I got in that my pastor asked me to be his assistant pastor. There's no way I could have done that had I moved away to Oshkosh. And, um, and, he, and he used to ask me, now, Brother G, are you sure you want to go that far away? You know, this is your church. Like, he would say things to me like, this is your church now or, or, or our church. And you, you know, you sure you want to be that far away? I stayed. So after I got out of college, I said, all right, now I want a black experience. I've been in Madison my whole life. I want a black experience. And I felt, man, like somebody grabbed me by my collar and again said, nope, 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 nope. Um, your work is going to be here in Madison. And I thought, you know, nobody's a prophet in their own town. Like nobody gets real respect in their own town. I don't want to, I know these streets. I know the people, I know the parks, I know the politics. I don't really want to be here. So when I got this sense that I was supposed to be here and I also, Henry, I got a sense. Uh, I remember this is my senior year. This is 85. I was sitting in the humanities building and uh, we had a lecture, was about to have a lecture about the role of the black church in, in, um, in um, U.S. history. And I remember praying a prayer saying, man, Lord, I, 
I want to, you know, although we're a small living room church, I want a black church experience. Like can't take cloth robes and I want that. And just like I heard that vision in my heart when I was 16, it said it's going to be on a hill. I heard that voice say the church that you lead is not going to be a black church. And I'm sitting in the room by myself waiting. And I said, now, Lord, if this is you, you do know that white people don't follow black leadership. Right. So and this is like 85, man. Nobody was talking about multi-ethnic church. Nobody was really talking about this kind of stuff. So for me to get this message that the church I'm leading is not going to be a black church, that it's going to be multi, nobody was even saying multicultural. That wasn't, yeah, even, it wasn't, a wasn't even a word. It wasn't, wasn't even a word. a word back then. I said, no, no, because white people don't do what black people say. And so, <laughs> no, I don't believe this is you. <laughs> so when it became apparent that I was going to get behind me, devil. Said, right, get me. Get, I did. Like, like whoever's talking to me in 1625 humanities, get the behind me because, you know, white people ain't down with this. This ain't God. This ain't even God. The devil is a lie. The devil is a lie. And so, man, I came and told the people in our church, don't leave Madison. Stay here. So the Fabu Carters, Rodney Tapp, Wanda mm -hmm. Tapp. Tracy Smith, who's married to David Smith, Sherry Lucille, who's married to my cousin, John Lucille. Um, I said to Pam Payne, who worked at Dane County, Middle Earth, I said to these people, don't leave. Help me build a young black middle class that can do more than drive BMWs. Let's drive BMWs, but let's give back to the community. Let's be tutors, mentors. Let's be, let's be the historic educated black folks who give back to the community. And they said, okay. And about a dozen of those folks stayed and helped me build Fountain of Life. They helped me build Nehemiah. Those are the people who believed in me when I was 21 years old, 22, made a decision. My wife, Jackie, they made a decision to not go back to their black hometowns to stay in Madison. And that's how we built what we built. I convinced black people to stay here with me. Wow. That's it. it's all, so it's all your fault. They're going back. Well, I hate to hear it. It's all, you know, it's all your fault. It's, it's interesting hearing your journey. Um, and like you, you're so decisive with your decisions, which is also interesting. When you when you decide to stay here and build the church, what would you say now, looking back, is your purpose? And I'm asking this because you started the church, and you mentioned Nehemiah. So for those who don't know Nehemiah, Nehemiah is not a church. Nehemiah right. is an economic development, workforce development nonprofit entity on its own, correct? Exactly. It's it's a it's a black focused um, um, human services, leadership development, um, economic development um, organization that strengths and empowers black folks so that they can transform the community. And we've been doing this for 30, 29 years. Next next fall, fall of 2022 will be our 30th year of operation. So, and the reason I'm asking, like, what you look back at your purpose is because some people know you as a pastor. Right. Some people you know as an like, uh, educator. Mm -hmm. Some people you know as just a, a black leader. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, you have these different hats. Um, but at some point, as a pastor, you made a decision also to get into that nonprofit lens in that lane, which most pastors, at least in the Midwest, most pastors and churches don't. I know down South, they, the bigger churches to get in that lane, but that's more recently. So what, what made you decide at that point that that was a part of your calling to start a Nehemiah platform sure. away from the church? Cause you could argue that to take away from the church. Clearly you felt like it didn't. So how did you make that decision? Well, theologically, I have I have an ecclesiology or an understanding of the mission of the, which is the mission of the church, that the church has nothing to do with four walls. It's the gathering of folks. So everything that um, that believers do is part of the church is part of the part of the family. So like my daughter, Lexi, is not just a G when she's in my house, when she's at school, when she's at work. She's still my daughter representing our family. And I feel that way about the church as well. Yeah. And so uh, and what I realized that even with the larger churches in the South, they didn't necessarily get into they might. Some of them got into housing, but they did a lot of it through their own church structure and not really as something that didn't belong to the church. So Nehemiah was created because in the 80s and 90s, you remember the black community. It just it mushroomed. It, it almost doubled in that decade. We started, and, you know, because of that, we had this welfare reform. People thought that black folks were coming in for benefits, that they were double dipping in Chicago and Madison. So when I saw the number of black people increasing, but not the number of black service providers, I became concerned. 
I saw unprecedented numbers of black kids going to juvenile corrections when white kids were getting support, community support. Black kids were going to mental hospital, mental health hospitals and, and white kids were getting mentors. And so the only the only industry that really kept up with the growth of diversity in our community was law enforcement, was the police department. In terms of diversity, that's the only one that kept up with us. So down the street of Somerset Circle, we noticed that kids needed help with homework. So we created a, a homework club where we brought food down to kids, did a homework club. And once a week, we might do a little Bible study with them. But the idea was to let them know that they had a purpose. It wasn't about proselytizing kids so we can get donors. We wanted kids to understand you're alive. There's a purpose for your life. You may not see yourself reflected in the city, but you can do great things. And so state journals start catching stories on things we were doing in Somerset. And there was a gentleman who was a community, re community reinvestment um, officer for a local church, a local bank. He said, you know, you should create a 501c3, a separate organization, and develop more programs for kids and get grants for it. And I said, people give money to do what we're doing? I said, Yes. We started planning for like a year, year and a half. In the early 90s, we launched Nehemiah in 92. And um, that was because we realized that folks did not want to fund a church, and understandably so, to do community programming. So we created Nehemiah, which is a 501c3, which means a tax-exempt corporation, separate board, finances, strong firewall that's completely separate from, from Fountain of Life. But it was Fountain of Life's vision to be a presence outside the walls that allowed us to create an entity that was not controlled by or run by the church. And that piece is unique. Most of the churches that were creating separate entities were still controlling them. The church was controlled. I, I hired people who didn't belong to our church. I hired people who were not black. I hired people who were not Christian. I hired people um, you know, at one point we spoke three languages at, at, at staff meeting because we had a contract to work with um, the Southeast Asian community, Latino community, black community, and, and, and some of the rural white community members. And so um, it was interesting for a local community-based black-led organization that was faith-based. That doesn't mean it's religious, but it meant out of a faith-based conviction that all people have dignity and it is our job to cultivate it, that all people are worthy of and capable of experiencing transformation it was that was our that was our impetus. And so we were launched into the social service arenas where other agencies were making referrals to us um, with a focus on black youth, um, economic development and leadership development of black youth. Then we realized some of what was wrong with it. Some of what was ailing our children was was the poor relationships with their parents. So then um, we added a um, in-home family therapy component and we became contracted for that. And my mom, who had been a single mom, single black mom raising two kids here from Chicago, became a family therapist for single moms moving to Madison for a better life for their children. And that started the road of Nehemiah really serving as, a, as, a, as an organization that didn't do traditional human services. That's what people saw it as because we had um, social workers and case managers and therapists and mentors, but it really was about leadership development and helping people to move towards their own transformation because the best hope for the community is transformed individuals. Very innovative, right? Spe really innovative. And what's interesting to me about that also is a lot of things that people complain about the black church or the church in general is that they're not doing anything outside the church walls. They don't want people to just come to the church. You So you were kind of ahead of that curve, right? You were way you ahead kind of, of that curve. Yeah. You, and and it was, it's also interesting that like you kind of took the model of our elders, like from the South, mm -hmm. we were saying we're just doing a church and you kind of just professionalize it. Like I'm putting a C3 entity. I'm going to make it, right. I'm going to take that work that they're doing and make, make it an entity, which is interesting. So now we fast forward. And can I just say one thing quickly, Henry? Yeah. Nehemiah gave me a chance to leave my job at the university and to work full time. See, I've been working for um, the university full time and volunteering my time at the church. People talk a lot about black pastors and what we make and what we do. I'm volunteering at the church for these two decades. Like this was, I was a professional pastor, but this was not my only role. The role of Nehemiah allowed me to hire staff. So there are things that Nehemiah could do that the church couldn't do because we had resources. And so when you have a church with 30, 40 people, you don't have the resources to have all of these programs and all of these things. And our goal 
we were just as committed to youth employment as we were youth Sunday school, because we feel that all of that was a part of your personal development and your personal growth. So I just want to say that it was an innovative way for a pastor of a black church to find a way to be more available to the church for a church that couldn't afford to have a pastor of my caliber, my experience. So, so when I started Nehemiah, that's where I got my benefits. That's where I got retirement. That's where I got payment, which made me available to Fountain of Life because I was closer to Fountain of Life in our own offices rather than being down on campus. And so people really would be well served if they were to study the ingenuity of the black church rather than trying to pick um, trying to pick holes at it. But as a young 20 something, I thought very creatively about how to make money so that I could be more available to my community. I love that. Like, you know, like I, I absolutely love that. All right, you said, okay, I'm going to figure out one. I'm right. a pastor. I love this is my calling. Right. I got I got to figure out so I can do my calling more, but it has to stay in the lane where I feel God's called me right. to help people. So I'm, I'm going to start a C3 entity that can help me pay my bills, take care of myself, and I can still be this full-time pastor and help people at the same time. Exactly. An entity I can. That, fits a, that is innovative, and that is, uh, you know, that just out the box, right? It's like just out the box to it have is. that. Yes, and it the, takes the, courage. Yeah, man. The downside of it is, and this is where I'm a little jealous of people like you, because you're able to be called an entrepreneur. If you don't do this kind of work in a for business arena, no one ever called me an entrepreneur. When I look back and I think that was so entrepreneurial, I went oh, yeah, to a conference, sure. saw what people were doing. I said, wait, you're raising money to do this? Came back, got some friends together, met for a year to plan this, went and got money from the community foundation and local churches and cast this vision as a 20 something year old and to have people still be supporting me today who supported me back in the early nineties. And I was not called an entrepreneur. I was called a black leader. I wasn't called a leader, a business leader, entrepreneurial. I was called a black leader. He's a, he's a, he's a community per he's a community leader. That was straight up entrepreneurial. That was a business I created. I started it. That for no doubt. Like that was a very innovative business. And, (laughs) It stand the test of time, right? Yes. It's just stood the test of time, right? Yes. Um, yes. Okay, so you, you're, you, you Steve Jobs the game, right? Like you, you become an innovator, uh, entrepreneur, <laughs> uh, and you, you create Nehemiah. Fast forward to now. Okay. Let's get past Justify Anger. People know about Justify sure. Anger and how that stuff came. So now you are a 57-year-old entrepreneur, pastor, father, husband, leader, all at the same time, right? So, right. Like, you know, that's that's a lot in itself, balancing that out. So what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Do you have a for-profit business now? Or, or, <laughs> yes. or I still don't have a, well, I'm sorry, let me let you finish the question so I can answer it correctly. No, not me. Like, like, because I, because I, I know you. I know you're doing a lot. I know you're doing speaking. I know you're doing training. I mean, I know you're doing so much. Is that like who's? What are you doing all at this point in your life? <laughs> from a past and all those things. Like, what are you? What are those things that you're doing right sure. now? Sure. Well, I will say this: what people don't know, necessarily know about Justified Anger that it's an initiative of Nehemiah that really started working with the non-Black population, about training them through history, about to understand how we got here so that they could help us dismantle systemic racism. Um, but what folks don't understand was, is we got funding for that endeavor um, because we found that the work we were doing with white allies and our Black Leadership Institute, you came to speak to, I think, our first cohort of that yeah. Leadership Institute. Yeah, We're showing that the tr- building Black leadership and building non-Black allyship reduces microaggressions. So I'm working closely with Dr. Julando Jackson and his We Labs to document the work that we're doing. And so we're showing that if we have white allies who are doing their work in the workplace, on boards, in the communities to reduce um, um, craziness that would promote uh, or uh, microaggressions for black folks, it would help black people to live longer. So we got a million dollar grant to do this work. Well, with COVID coming on, I knew that we would not be able to have our U.S. Black History class that had maxed out at 270 last year. We created an online platform and we have 1,700 people that are currently registered. 550 synchronistic learners. Every Monday night, they come on to Zoom link. We break them up into 50 Zoom rooms to discuss it and 1,200 who are doing it asynchronistically, including the Verona School District and people in the Oregon School District. 
that's become a business model that supports our work. And so our traditional funders didn't understand why I was working with white folks. They just wanted me to fix black people and didn't think white folks had any fixing uh, or were in need of any fixing. So I want to say that being an entrepreneur and being a leader in this community means you have to speak truth to white people and say, if you know how to fix this with all of your tens of millions of dollars in your collective foundations, you would have fixed it. The reason why it's unfixed is that you don't know how to fix it. So you're not going to coach me on how to fix these issues. And you're not going to put your issues on me. And you're not going to pay me to babysit black people. I know that Wisconsin is oppressive and progressive at the same time. Your liberal white folks are part of the problem. And so I'm going to train them. And so now, you know, we've got people coming at us for training and then folks go through the Justified Anger History class and then their organizations hire us to train them. So we're training school districts. I'm training the Milwaukee Bucks right now. Um, we're, you know, so, so folks are hearing about the work that we're doing and they're calling us to do these things with businesses and CEOs. But we were doing this before COVID-19, before George Floyd, before Breonna Taylor, like the Wayne Gretzky thing, we skated to where the puck was going. So when all the stuff hit the fan, people said, who knows this? Who does this? And for whom is this not a knee-jerk reaction? I say all of that because in our work to reduce the microaggressions that's cutting life short for black and brown people, my research is showing me we need physical space together. So now we're getting white folks ready. We're getting black people to, to we're bringing them through leadership models. But what we don't have that other cities have is the bookshops, um, the clubs, the places for plays and um, theater, children's community theater. We don't have space for black entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial development, leadership development. We don't have place for black plays and playwrights to work. We don't have place to display the work of the 100 black artists who are commissioned to work on State Street to paint boarded up jewelry, jewelry stores. And we don't have a place to centralize our history. Like people you and I know who are black first you know, people from Africa, the Caribbean, Afro-Latino, and who are North American Black, if we're not careful, we're not going to have anything to pay homage to the Francis Huntley Coopers, uh, to the to the Miss Teresa Sanders, to you starting your business, to Dr. Richard Harris, to, you know, all the history makers in 20 years, Henry, they're not going to be around. And our kids won't even know that we knew them. They won't even understand it. So we need a place to put that history up for perpetuity. So the work of the Center for Black Excellence and Culture is to say, if we want to stop the revolving door on Madison of Madison Blacks who don't feel like there's any room or evidence of Black, um, um, of room for Black exceptionalism, we'll carve our own way in Dallas, in Atlanta, in places in North Carolina. And now we're seeing, a, we're seeing the greatest migration of Blacks from the North to the South. Cool. In U.S. history. So yeah. we have these blaring disparities, but it's not offset by black space. And so we are unapologetically saying, listen, businesses, you're bemoaning the fact that you don't have a diverse workforce. Your competition isn't with Epic or Exact Sciences or SSM. Your competition is with Madison, Wisconsin at 5 p.m. when black folks want to know, where can I see other black people and see a comedy or watch a football game? or just have workspace and it's only black people around me. And how do we do that unapologetically? So the work of our center is connected with our work. Sometimes the broader community, the white community wants to say, well, you're building a center now. What about justified anger? And I think, have you not been listening? It's all connected. It's all connected. What Have you not been listening? I said, black people need to be at the table setting our own agenda. Can we not set an agenda of what's good for black people? Well, well, what about like making it multicultural? And Listen, our brothers and sisters in Chicago, New York, have a Jewish cultural center. My buddy who's Korean American has a Korean cultural center because they want to preserve and teach their kids original language. and They want to celebrate stuff. Our kids, when I was in first grade, I'm getting excited. When I was in first grade, Brother Sanders, my black first, my black teacher, Mrs. Turner, who's still my pen pal, she's 101. We still write each other. She has been writing me since I was six in 1970. She told me I was going to be the first black president of the United States in 1969. I come to Madison in 1970, Lapham School, room 207, Miss Barbara Carls. I'm taught that I was a slave. A black teacher with an all black class didn't think that I needed to know that I was a slave. I come where I'm one of two black kids and I learn around with a room full of white kids. You all were, 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 you know, were superior. I was an enslaved person. No, I was a slave. We didn't have the knowledge to say an enslaved person. 
Who the hell thought that was smart to teach six year olds about slavery? Do you think we talked about the strengths of of, of um, the black men who are elected to, to Congress or or the or the, the starters with the HBCUs or the Divine Nine and the sororities and fraternities and the and the um, um, Harlem Renaissance? No, you are slaves. Boom. Now let's talk. Get out your reader. Let's look at our at our reading books. I, I went home and my mom said she looked in my eyes and said, baby, what's wrong? And I said. Mom, were we really slaves? Like this was a foreign concept to me. I went to Head Start in Chicago, kindergarten and first grade, never heard the word slavery. I walk into an all white school, one other black kid, I'm taught I was a slave. And then we're asking, what's wrong with black kids? What's wrong with black boys? Why are they losing interest in second and third grade? Do you think I saw myself in any literature other than that black man in a chain? That's the only place I saw myself in a textbook that a whole freaking year. So, yeah, we need space where we teach history and the teachers come to us to be taught. The social workers come to us to be taught. The attorneys come to us to be. We're going to become a training center and a center of centers. And so I want there to be I want there to be headquarters there, of black thought. I want it to not only sell um, uh, whatever, whether it's black, cult, you know, black cuisine or black rental space. I want us to sell black intelligentsia. I want us to sell black intellectual property. I want to sell what I know. I want to sell what I've done. We have just reduced us to being people who can sell t-shirts and make sandwiches. We have made the university rich. We have made the state of Wisconsin rich. We have made local businesses rich. We're about to make ourselves rich. And I want to be a place where we can gather that Organizations will pay to come and sit with us and get re reap the benefit of us as they sit at our collective black feet and listen to us talk to them. So the military can come, business can come, hell, Nike can come. People can come and hear us, but we are tired of giving this stuff to white people for free so that you can go get rich and then make excuses why you can't hire us or promote us. We're going to sell our black intellectual property out of this place and become a center of black thought. And so that's why we're building that center. I like you like, like you were just preaching right there, black man. Woo! <laughs> like it, it's like, what I was interested. I saw the passion. Like you, like your whole your whole demeanor changed. Like your whole body, like the tone. Like you, like you are all <laughs> like like you just changed. Like oh my, you went from Doctor G to you went from Doctor Alexander G to G from the South Side. Yes. Like you, like you, you changed quickly. What's What's interesting? You said so much there, and I think. This is part of the reason we started like our Wisconsin Leadership Summit, right? To have where people of color can be around people of color. I right? love that it's you like, do that. Love that you do I, that. And and people ask like, why? Like, yeah, white people, you can come. Like, I'm not saying you're not, you can't come, but recognize it's for us. And it's for people of color getting together so we can talk to each other. We can see each other. We can have that debate, whatever. And like we do our most influential list, right? And people are like, well, why do you do the black power list and the Latino list? Like, should be a multicultural? No, no. Sometimes you need to highlight the people in their own community, their own, their own ethnicity, and the, all their culture. So, yeah, I want to highlight the Latino people and all the beautiful work that they do exactly. and all the richness. And the Asian community, all the richness and the, the wonderful history that they do. Like, I want, to, I, want to, I want to appreciate what they do, and then we can come together. But sometimes highlight and like what these people are doing. So I, I appreciate what you said about that. And I, you know what you also said something that, that was really true. Is that 20 years from now, people won't remember this stuff. I interviewed just Annette Miller uh, the other day, and we we're talking like people are not going to remember Lamar Billups. Mm -mm. People are not going to remember Milton McPike. People might know his name, Milton McPike, uh, Eugene Parks, Ben Parks, right? You go down the list. Where do you go to that see that together, though? Like, we may know the names, but where do you go to see them collectively to do that and where their stories are told in high tech? Man, yeah. I get you. I, we, man, yeah, listen. I, we, we, we got to do like, that, man. We hired a um, consulting organization. It's called Lord Cultural Resources. They wrote the business plan and did um, did the um, consultancy work for the Smithsonian Black History Museum in D.C. So we just contracted them to advise us on our project. And because um, we want to know how to do this and how to put the business plan together for it. Because if black people don't tell black people's story, we can't blame white people for doing it. We've waited. <sighs> they haven't. They keep telling our babies that they used to be slaves. If we sit back and don't teach our children this, then shame on us. So where do, we, where do we come to get our kids prepped for um, like what's the, what's 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 the on ramp for the people program at UW Matter? Like who's getting elementary kids ready? Nehemiah has been doing it for 20 22, 23 years. So we're just thinking about how we become 
a cultural hub or where black people want to be. We want it to become a national example. Not that other cities don't have some of these things, you know, but to have it together, to have it black shaped and black led and to have the white community understand that this has got to be black led and black shaped, not, and they're not up in arms about it. And we're not being apologetic. What it means is we're already aligning them to what the community needs to have for a thriving black community. The alignment begins now so that when a center is built, they understand that if we're able to maintain more black people here, they have a potential for a greater customer base, greater employee base. So they're beginning to understand we need black people to do the work to help us become more diverse. We don't need more consultants. We need black people who are willing to stay in Madison. And right now they aren't. So we want to help you all do this because we need you. Yeah, it's, and I totally I agree with everything you just said. There needs to be intentionality to how you mm-hmm. keep black folks here and how you do it. And ask the question, why haven't we done it well? And why aren't they staying? Uh, you know, so I think that's so true. Even when we started Master 65, it's sort of the same thing. We, to change the narrative. We don't want people, other people telling us our story about how we are, what we look like and how we sound. And I don't need you telling that. Right. I, 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 I know Pastor G. I'll go talk to Pastor G myself. I don't need you to see your lens to tell me about this. I'm exactly. going to go to exactly. the so, so and that's why our numbers are, are what they are, right? So our numbers just show that people of color can lead and mm-hmm. dominate from a business perspective and people want our content. Oh, yes. But so one thing, two things before we go. One, um, you have everything you've said, you have been unapologetically black. Um, through this whole time, like you mean, like you, there's no, I don't hear any imposter syndrome in you. No, mm-hmm. I have to go and smile. And like the whole thing you've said the whole time is, nope, I want white people to come to me. I'm going to train white people. They're going to come to learn from us. Like everything has been, you have been very rooted in your identity as a black person and as a black man. And I think one of the biggest problems we have in Madison is people are not really rooted in their black identity. Um, and so they get, they get apologetic for their blackness, right? And it's really fascinating to me to watch it. Going back to what you said about your school, anyone who's gone through the mass and school system, almost every black person I know has those type of stories. Of course. Almost all, like I tell people all the time, I survived the mass and school system. It was traumatizing. I survived it. I absolutely survived the system. So how did you, how did you, what's the, if we have a young person listening right now, who's growing up in the Madison area or in Midwest. This is a Midwest phenomenon. As you mentioned earlier, there's a remigration. Black folks are moving back down South. Mm-hmm. What would you tell a person in the, who, who's listening to this? How do you keep your identity as a black person and be unapologetic about it at the same time, thrive in a majority white area with a majority white mindset and white culture? You know, um, it's, a, it's a great question. And I want to be completely honest with you. There are times I went through that struggle as well. Um, you know, when you grow up in Madison, sometimes people say you're too black to fit with the white crowd and they're too white to fit with the black crowd. Yeah. Um, and so in, in seeing a lack of thought leaders as role models, um, I struggled. When I started my nonprofit, it was white leaders who came around me. It was not the black headhunters. It was not the black leaders who, came, except for Miss Malele, who came and put their arms around me and said, here's how you do this. It was white people that introduced me to the funders, to the board members, to Rotary, to Madison Club. And so part of me said, when I'm in a place of prominence, when and if I come into my own, I don't want black people to not have black people to speak into their lives. And so then I also developed a theology that I was not created accidentally as black. I wasn't left in the office in the oven too long that in God's ingenuity, this is who I was supposed to be. And then I reflected back on my history as an undergrad and the beauty and the strength of African-American history and the resilience of our people and how we've created culture. You know, one of our professors at our history class says a defeated people can't create culture. So the fact that we have music and food that have shaped not just America, but the world. Um proves that we are resilient, that we have culture. And then when I went to West Africa a few years ago for the, um, for the year of return, 400 years after um, the first slave trade um, um, journey, transatlantic journey, 
and one of the tour guard tour guides in the slave dungeon said you all were stolen from us 400 years ago and 400 years later you all have come back to show us the strength of mother africa and that you have not forgotten us please know black americans you are the descendants of the strongest of the strong of our nation and you are resilient and man henry that hit me so hard i said when i come back home i'm not going to be apologetic um, I'm not going to just focus on all the issues that have plagued us. I'm going to remind black people that we are resilient, that we have not only touched and shaped America, but the world, that that's got to be part of the narrative. We changed the name of what was going to be our African-American Center for Excellence to the Black Center, the Center for Black Excellence and Culture, because we've got to unite the black diaspora. I saw that by visiting the home of W. Du Bois, the burial ground of um, a President uh, Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, I felt my black nationalism rise up inside me. I felt solidarity with those folks. I was in W.E. E. Du Bois' home. You know, he was an alpha. I was in his home, <laughs> and I saw a picture of Gaddafi, and I jumped. because That's like seeing a picture of, um, you know, Bin Laden. I said, Gaddafi? Like, what? And I asked the question, what's Gaddafi doing here? And they started talking about the relationships between the black presidents. And President uh, Nkrumah said, I will not be satisfied until there's United States of Africa. And this whole sense that they were not divided, that even though they're different nationalities, they were uniting as black people. It just, I said, well, I've only been told the bad stuff about Gaddafi. I haven't been told about how black people saw him in Africa. So I just got this, uh, this readjustment and just said, there's too much that we know. There's too much that we've done. There's too much that we have withstood. And if we don't have a center where we can celebrate the black people who we were told were bad black people, that were dangerous black people. Like you don't want to follow this black, but we can come and just be a center where black excellence is told. I think that it will have a riveting, rippling, healing, therapeutic effect on black people because we cannot give this mainly white community our best until there is space where we can be our best. And so, <laughs> What this. has helped me stay black is understanding that I ain't got to get be black. I get to be black. It's not something that I do un, that I do apologetically. I feel so fortunate to have the strength of all of those elders and all of those people and folks who rode across in that journey and became dehydrated and said goodbye to their families and all of that stuff. And they did not deny their blackness and did not deny their faith. How could I then deny all of that? I get to be black in America. I get to wear the skin in this country in a way that helps people to understand. If you want to understand, to, help, to know, if you want to understand resilience, intellect, ingenuity, creativity, entrepreneurialism, survival, leadership development, you need to talk to somebody black because we did it without stealing it from somebody else or raping oh. their bodies or oh. taking their kids uh -oh. or stealing their lands uh -oh. or stealing their wives or putting uh -oh. their kids in school. We uh -oh. did it without destroying anybody else. And so uh -oh. if you want to talk about leadership, then Henry Sanders, you should be the one that's doing it and not some other entities and agencies because we are the recipients of and the descendants of people who have exuded and shaped leadership without uh -oh. robbing another country. What you said was so powerful to me. And I, I always tell people that, you know, we've we were slaves longer than we've been free. Right. Right. So people are like you have to put things in concept. And what I love what you said is from a narrative perspective of I think a lot of times black folks hear that, you know, you haven't done this or don't poor you or whatever. I was flipping what you just said. Black folks, what black folks have done is amazing. It is a beyond a miracle. What black folks have done for be slaves to dictate culture. Yes. To spend how much money we spend money, more money than most countries, black yes. folk, right? Yes. For being educated, for there be even a pastor G, from there even being a black president from Obama to uh, the, we have, we have, overcome so much yes we have we it is amazing we're black like we are if if when a world ended tomorrow and the world started again people come back and will study how did these black folks overcome all this stuff from discrimination laws to breaking up families to like in, in, incarcerations like all these things how did they 
How do they still thrive and still dictate so much in our country? Bring it back to the uh, presidency, our, our national elections. They can't win. Democrats can't win our black vote. Come on now. They can't win our black vote. I mean, this shows how much power yes. and how much and so much resiliency the black folks have come. So when people talk to me about stuff, I'm like, yeah, what? Well, black folks would have overcome so much. I mean, we should be studied. We should be studied on the resiliency we've shown to actually overcome and thrive. It's it's. We're going to study it in our center. We are going to study it because we're we're not going to let white entities come and study our story and make money off of it. So they don't tell our story because it helps them to make money. And then when it becomes um, productive, then people want to sell it to make money. Nope, nope, nope. We're not just going to sell the story, but the ingredients, the the essence of what, of, of what made us who we are and how that can energize businesses. They're going to have to pay us for that information. Yeah. I, I, I love it. I love it. And again, I, even more, I love what you're saying is the mindset of how you say you went back to Africa. And I think that what that person who told you that's so true. What we, the resiliency of what black folks have come to, oh, America, our American experience is nothing less than miraculous. And people should be right. writing history books. I mean, it should be, uh, America should be applauding it. Every white American, whatever, Asian, whatever, Native American, you should be applauding the black experience, how they've accomplished so much. Right. So I, I think we are the American dream. We are. Oh, we are. I think we, we are. are an American dream. Um, so anyways, so pastor, before I let you go, this has been a wonderful, uh, you preach, you educated, <laughs> you know, you go, I'm going to get some hate mail off this, uh, but all, all of this. Oh, really? But I, that's okay. I, I get you. You're strong. You're strong. Get, you can, you can do it. it. <laughs> I, lo I love everybody. So I, I, I love yes. everybody. Tell me what they feel. I love it. Um, okay. So pastor, ask everyone this question. If you could have a superpower, what superpower would it be? Just one. Don't, don't, you know, don't say I could have this, 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 just one. Uh, the ability to fly. I don't even have to think about, I don't even have to think about that. My fly. superpower would be flying. It, it has always been, it's been close between that and, and be, being invisible. But, um, but I think that was tied into something else. I want to be seen, um, but, mm. but flying. Getting really? from one place to another, moving, the freedom, the liberty, not being held back. There's something about personal freedom. Um, flight and freedom that just has excited me as a, you know, as a kid. That's why I love Superman. He could fly. Well, that's a great answer. I didn't notice his strength and stuff, but he could fly. He could get somewhere quick and where yeah. he wanted to. Yeah, freedom. I watched the old. I watched the old Superman in black yeah, and white. Black and white. Free. Yeah, yeah. The kids, they don't know nothing about that. Yeah, they don't yeah. know nothing about that. But for yeah. me, it's an easy one. It's a to to fly well uh pastor dr alexander g uh thank you for your time this has been a awesome awesome podcast Man. i hope people listen to it you said so much uh it was it was a it was again it was a a, a blessing to hear you and your wisdom so much wisdom so much Man, wisdom in this podcast uh and so thank you all that you're doing continue to keep doing what you're doing Black Excellence Center, which I, I'm not. I'm like I'm gonna become a cheerleader. You got me sold on it. Like I'm like, oh yeah, I get it. Uh, I, I love it. So thank you. Keep being innovative. Keep being the entrepreneurial person that you are. Keep being a leader. Uh, leadership is not easy. No, it's not. And, and not you know, people think it's easy. People, everyone thinks they can be a leader. Not everyone can be a leader or should want to be a leader. It's a right. burden that most people, not everyone can do. So thank you for that. And also, I wanted I. This is 365 Media.